Hello, hello. So I think uh, we're the uh, final uh, panel just before the long-awaited keynote, uh, closing keynote from Cedrico. Um, so we're going to try and keep this high energy. I know this is the last session of the day. So, um, so founders, are you Asia ready? Um, just can I just have a quick show of hands in the audience? Who is an entrepreneur or founder? Okay, who's an investor? Okay, then there's a whole bunch of in-between. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we have the honor, um, my name is Shayan Sanyal. I uh, work in the startup segment for AWS, Amazon Web Services here in France. And uh, I have the honor of actually having uh, two esteemed uh, panelists for this session. Um, first person is, I'd like to introduce is Fleur Pellerin. Uh, Fleur founded Corellia Capital in 2016. Right, and uh, it's, you've got a 200 million uh, euro fund, right? Yeah. And uh, essentially focused uh, primarily in scaling European startups, but also helping them penetrate the Asian market. So this is, uh, uh, and previously Fleur was uh, Minister of Culture and Communications as a civil servant for the French government, and various roles before that in digital uh, and innovation. And uh, I'm also honored to welcome Han Kim, Han Kim is the managing director and co-founder of Altos Ventures. Uh, you're based in California, right? Right. Right. And, uh, and, and Altos Ventures is uh, essentially focused on uh, helping uh, Asian companies right, scale uh, in, in Asian markets. So we're going to have a, a, a perspective of like Asian con concentrated, but also Europe going into Asia. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump really straight into it, uh, guys. And first of all, you know, why should we, why should we even care, right? Why should we care that uh, founders are Asia ready? What's, what's, what's the big deal, right? I'm gonna just throw the softball right here. So I think first it's not an obligation, of course, but uh, I, I think the Asian markets, and I put an S because I think there's not one Asian market, but many Asian markets, like there are many European countries markets. Um, but I think it can bring a very interesting opportunities um, for uh, European or for French startups to develop their businesses, uh, either because from a sectorial point of view, it can be uh, an opportunity to be close to very big players like, you know, Samsung or, um, or uh, you know, when you're in the chips business, for example, being close to the place where in Taiwan or in, uh, in, uh, in Korea or in China, uh, where uh, all the big players are, are located can be an opportunity. And I see many French startups actually uh, in this chip business, for example, trying to uh, expand into Asia because it's close to their potential customers. So sectors can be one opportunity. And also because the markets, I think, are very mature, are maturing. Uh, there's a strong uh, technology uh, edge, I think, in, uh, uh, in, uh, Asian, um, in most Asian uh, countries. So for applications, for uh, uh, very techy uh, products, there's an appetite and an early adopter attitude in, uh, in Asia that can bring good opportunities. So, you know, these two uh, already uh, uh, opportunities can, be, uh, can trigger uh, the decision uh, to go to Asia. So you, I think we talked about yeah, Asia is a really broad market. So um, we often hear about uh, you know Asia first strategies going into China or India, these massive markets. Han, I'm really curious. Like, is this the right thing to do? Um, are you seeing are you seeing like countrywide approaches? Are you seeing you know the, the the big markets like China and India going first, or is it something else entirely? I, I think it really depends on the business. Um, for if you're going into China. There's not much else you could do other than focus on China and within China, which cities. So for a lot of uh, companies that's outside of Asia, when you're thinking about launching into Asia, we think about, okay, what's our China strategy? What's our India strategy? And which are the com uh, countries that we want to approach first? Or sometimes, which are the cities that we want to actually go after? So a lot of the consumer service companies, we, we take apart the characteristics of each city and figure out which cities we want to prioritize and go after. And, and some of these cities are just really big. M I mean, and these are like tens of millions of people jam-packed together in a much smaller uh, 
confined space. So a lot of times the biggest advantage of these cities is that the acquisition cost of a customer is substantially low. And it, when, you, when you sort of compare it with the LTV, it's, it becomes a very attractive proposition. You, thanks for that. Um, you kind of, you touched on something, Claire, that I want to come back on, which was sectors and verticals, right? Are there some verticals that work better uh, in, in, in parts of Southeast Asia or Asia? Um, you know, we, we see the success of, uh, you know, fashion and, and luxury brands like LVMH doing very well. Um, are, are, there, are there other sectors that we can be looking into uh, in these markets that make sense uh, for European companies to get into? Well, I think I if you talk about luxury, like you know, an extending sector, you know, I'm an investor in the Vialet, for example, and I hope a lot of you have visited the nice uh, booth that we have here. It's a high-end product. You could say it's a luxury good, and definitely uh, for this kind of uh, product, so high-end, targeting uh, uh, a really niche market. Sometimes, uh, as Han was saying, uh, targeting metropolis, targeting very big cities is sometimes a good strategy. So there are definitely very big opportunities in Asia for this kind of products. But then it's not in Asia, it's really in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Shanghai, uh, in Beijing. So it will be really not market as a whole, but then, you know, micro markets in cities. Like metro, but definitely metro luxury markets, is yeah. one, many others. I mean, applications, I mean, um, uh, what gaming, etc. Yeah. Th there are some... Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I hear you on that, but what about things like telecommunications? Like, for example, um, you know, we, we see, like, uh, let's see the advent of 5G, for example, that's happening in, in uh, across the world. Is that something that can influence different kinds of companies getting ideas to get into Asia? I think regarding mobile 5G, some of the service companies, like consumer-facing companies, will likely come actually out of Asia because I think 5G is going to take place in a more centrally directed uh, governments, which are a lot of the Asian countries where the government will just mandate, we're gonna go into 5G, we're gonna just turn ourselves 5G ready, and that we're gonna incur whatever the cost that it takes. And I think until you have that environment, you're not gonna really see what's possible. And I think that's going to actually happen in Asia first before anywhere else. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of technology layers that will enable that environment to happen. And I think some of those could be a pretty interesting opportunity. The other opportunity, I think, which doesn't exist today, but may could come, I think, over the next five to 10 years is in the software space. And I think lot, there's a lot of great European talents in software. Software market in Asia really don't exist right now. It's very small, mostly because in Asia, a lot of the family control businesses are very large congl conglomerates and they own everything. And they own their own system integrators, which makes customized software. But now a lot of these companies or conglomerates are facing competition from the rest of the world and they have to be competitive. And in order for them to be competitive, they are starting to break up their own conglomerates and outsourcing whatever they need to outsource and buy uh, off the shelf software when it's feasible. And I, I think it's going to just speed up. It's just a matter of time before all those things become much more competitive and software vendors that actually provide great um, value for money should succeed in Asian markets. So I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into that, but this is th these are great vectors. You're talking about opportunities across multiple sub-ecosystems, say of mobile communications, 5G, so it could be apps or something else. Um, and, and you mentioned business software where it seems like, right, it, traditionally it's been sort of more in-house or built, built at home, right? But there's more, you're seeing trends on purchasing outside, made outside, right? Um, <coughs> it's interesting because, you know, when we were at the uh, Elysee Palace yesterday and we were listening to uh, President Macron speak about various initiatives that, you know, to help uh, create the next 25 unicorns, for example, in, in France, one of the things that he mentioned was ownership around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and, and really trying to 
kind of uh, trying to create a, a, a French platform for that. Uh, and we have obviously a lot of uh, great engineering and great skills in France around AI. Um, is there an opportunity around AI and, and chips and things like that that you're seeing, for example, uh, Fleur? I think there is, but you know, mostly um, wh what I think it, is that it's going to be very difficult in the years to come for uh, the single countries on a standalone basis to compete against the tech giants, whether they be Chinese or American. So I think you know, creating alliances uh, industrial, technology, uh, capital, uh, whatever, I is something ca that can be very smart. And like, for example, if you think of uh, uh, what was uh, mentioned right now, which is, I, I think, a, a huge opportunity, 5G will be, de will be deployed in, uh, in Tokyo for the Olympic Games, it will be deployed a bit earlier in, uh, in Korea, and it will be commercially uh, offered, uh, I think, uh, this year. So there will be a, like, 12, uh, 18 months to two years advance compared to the European countries. I think for a French company who, or a European company who has you know, some plans of developing products and need a very slow, a very uh, no latency, for example, there is an opportunity not maybe to try to do it uh, by, by itself, but to try to find partners in Korea, for example, where you can find a great ecosystem in this mobile application environment. So I would more you know, encourage uh, our founders to find alliances, to find partners, and try to build big success stories that could be Euro-Asian. I think that's a new paradigm, but I, I, I see more uh, uh, opportunities in, in that, you know, uh, in that bridge between the two uh, regions. So like synergies maybe with companies like LG or Samsung or I mean, they are very Huawei. strong. Uh, <laughs> even if they have this culture of not really of trying to develop everything in-house, yeah. still they are very powerful, you know, B2C players, and it can be, great opportunities because they have a whole ecosystem and they have the hardware, so it can be good partners for, for, for French or European companies. So you used, you used the three letters, right, the B2C, which I, I kind of want to dive deep on a little bit because, um, you know, B2C is hard enough, right, in Europe and in the US um, for startups. Um, I'd be curious to know if, uh, they say that you're a successful B2C startup in, in, in France or in Europe, uh, you know, let's say consumer goods, right? Um, and say that you're selling a ton of stuff in Europe. Does that mean that you're Asia ready? Are you ready? Like you're, you're, you're flogging a lot of products, you're getting a lot of revenue. What's the, what's the challenge that you need to be aware of going into uh, Asian markets, uh, whether it's you know, China, like in the cities that you were talking about, or in South Korea? What are the challenges that you should be careful of as a consumer B2C company uh, going into Europe? Uh, I'll give Han, Han a chance to answer that. Sure. I I think, surprisingly, uh, in in a lot of the um, places in Asia, the the service standards that customers require from companies that are selling goods to the end customers is surprisingly much higher than what you would require from uh, uh, companies that sell products here. Uh, just give you an example. I I mean I grew up in the U.S., and so I, I'm very used to this sort of a U.S. service standards. And, you know, typically, it's just my cell phone. When there's a malfunction in my cell phone, I, I go to the shop. I typically would have to mail it, and I'd be without the phone, or I have a substitute phone for about a week. It takes, like, a few days to mail it out, and by the time you get back, usually a week has passed. In most places in Asia, that's just not acceptable. So like, I was surprised when my phone broke in Seoul, Korea. A uh, friend basically took me to a, uh, it was a Samsung phone at that time, took me to a Samsung shop. Basically, within 30 minutes, I was out of there with my phone fixed. And that's just a typical service level that they would require from any vendor that sells products to them. And it, it's, it's very similar even in digital products, the, the customer service level, how fast the companies would have to react to certain demands of customers. And so you just gotta be ready to hit that standards if you want to be successful.
so the bar is pretty high. Very high. I totally agree. And, and there's no second chance. I mean, if, uh, if somebody has a bad experience with a customer support service or something, uh, sometimes it w the product will not be given a second chance. So it's true that the standards are very high in terms of, uh, of uh, service in, in Asia. So, so it's kind of like, yeah, it's do or die on customer service. Okay. Yeah, there's no like holidays or weekends. There's no concept of that. Actually, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, because we're talking more about 24 by 7 type economies uh, versus 9 to 7 or 8 to 7 economies that we might be used to in Europe. I, I have a question about that. It's a bit of a, a different direction. But you know, when, when you start looking at market expansion, one of the things that you have to be concerned about is loss of power or loss of concentration of power in region or at HQ, right? So I'm thinking about the CEO mindset here in terms of readiness about well, you know, how much control should you relinquish and how much power should you relinquish to the satellites, right? The, the, the satellite firms that you're opening up in Asia. Uh, I'm curious to know what your opinions are on that and the effects. I think it's a very difficult question to answer because you know when you're a founder, you might have a management style that is more centralized and you don't want to uh, empower too much you know, uh, until you know, you're sure that everything's going well, etc. But if you would talk to my, for example, my LP, who's Naver, so a very big internet company uh, in Korea, they, uh, their policy was really to create subsidiaries in companies, but totally with a local sort of local governance uh, style, with local people, with a local uh, uh, listing, um, and to make the brand really uh, local, because they think that in the B2C, especially B2C or internet business, the markets are very local and the, the audience is local and they want local people to understand their needs and answer their needs. So um, it's quite Asian, I think, to uh, really try to adjust to each of the market and to really empower y the local teams because they are the best to understand you know, the, the local needs. Han, what do, you, what do you think about that? I mean, there's, there's different cultures, different work cultures and things like that. What, yeah. How much power should we let go of? As so I, I think it also might depend on each country. Some countries, you have to make decisions a lot faster than other countries. I think, for example, Japan, I think a lot of the international companies have been a little bit more successful because the decision making has to be a little bit more deliberate. So you have time to check with the headquarters on exactly whether or not your decision is correct. Countries like China or Korea, China, it's, it's just tough. Korea, it's been notoriously difficult for any foreign companies to succeed. J just to give you an example, eBay couldn't compete in Korea because you know, while they had the best resume executives, they had to go back to the headquarters to check every major decisions. So eventually they bought a company and then then another local company came up and started overtaking that company as well. So for the first company, they spent $400 million to buy. The second company, they spent $1.2 billion to buy. And even then, now there's another company that's overtaking them. So it's, I think when I look at the way they make decisions, they always have to go back to the headquarters in Silicon Valley. And we assume Silicon Valley decision making is fast, but in Asia, it's even faster. So without empowering the local executives to make decisions, I think it's tough to succeed in those types of countries. That's interesting. So <coughs> I think that um, it brings me to on the topic of as you start expanding into Asia or, or, or you know Asian markets, um, we start look, you know, we start thinking for founders, what is the support on the ground, right? I mean, there's cultural differences, there's language barriers, um, there's uh, work regulation, and there's the network. So, you know, you guys are helping out these startups scale out in, in Asia. Um, you're helping European startups do that. You're helping Asian startups, you know, concentrate in Asia. Um, what kind of support can you guys provide to, to, to founders that are getting into this market? Uh, can you give me an example of how you could help, for example, or Corellia could help strategically uh, getting, getting uh, European founders quickly up to speed and uh, up and running? 
So we have an office in, uh, in Seoul, so it's very important to have people who understand the market and local people who really understand the, the, the market. And what we would provide is really, really down to earth, you know, kind of support. It's uh, opening gates, trying to uh, uh, gain access to the decision making people, which in some conglomerates is very complicated because the managers can change every year. They are reviewed every year and there's a period of year where the big, you know, executives don't know if they will be, <laughs> if they will be there the next month. So sometimes it's very difficult to know to whom you should speak and having somebody who can open the doors to the big conglomerates decision making people is something that is very precious and can sa save you a lot of time. So that's the kind of things access would be a uh, uh, important access to capital because you know I think probably for uh, uh, a European company who would like to develop in, the in, in Asia it would be very important to have a financial partner like an investor that would be located in Asia to help also understand the, the, the market like Altos Venture for example. Like for follow on uh, investments for example yes, as well. Yes, okay. uh, I think that would so, so network uh, access, um, uh, local investors and, and support, you know, to uh, have uh, access to good retail partners, to good uh, hiring, uh, uh, to hiring for hiring talents, for example. So definitely having somebody on the ground uh, is really uh, uh, absolutely not, ni not nice to have, but a must have. Got it. Yeah, if you're a French entrepreneur that wants to target Asia, you have to come and speak to yeah. Floor. <laughs> and I will make an alliance with you, and uh, we will, I, I, we will I, go invest. So, are we signing a deal here? Are you guys going into a strategic partnership? Or yeah, we could, we could totally co-invest. <laughs> I mean, uh, we yep. have the same kind of spirit, I think, kind of a mindset. That's awesome. So, I think we're almost just about out of time. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to thank you very much for both your contributions on this. It's hard to boil the ocean on this one in 20 minutes. You can't. Uh, it's a vast region with uh, a lot of diversity. Uh, but I hope that you got uh, some nuggets out of it for uh, in your reflection on where to expand. So just two parting thoughts for both of you. So is an Asia first expansion strategy something that's realistic right now? Depends on the cases, but I, I wish it could become more realistic. And actually I see some people who think, you know, going east before going west. So I think now it can, it can be a, 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 a good strategy for some you know, businesses. And what about Asian, a Asian investment coming into Europe? You know, um, we put no rules. We have companies out of the US or out of Korea that actually started to get most of their customers and revenue from Middle East. We have a company that totally relocated their office from Seoul to Hamburg, Germany. And they're actually, th all their customer base is in Europe. Some basically stayed in Korea for, you know, four, five, six years, and, and they built a, you know, multi-hundred million dollar revenue company. So it's, I think, every company, it is very different, so. Great. Thank you so much, Fleur. Thank you, Hein. All right, let's see the space.